Hello again and welcome to the corner studio here in my garage and regular viewers I'm going to just tell you right now uh, this I'm shooting this a little different today you can see I've got two different microphones on here I've got two camera setup going because I'm testing the um, Nikon ZF in the studio the new camera and I want to see how it performs so I got to have sound for both it and my usual rig the Nikon Z8 I've also up above got uh, the Nikon Z30 pointed at the table for what we're doing. So this will make editing a nightmare later, but uh, we may be bouncing back and forth from all these different cameras. Today we're working on canvas flats and that would be this item here. Just a piece of canvas where I've drawn uh, either square, rectangle, whatever on here and treated it with, uh, prepped it with gesso. So, and um, what I'm going to do is roll through some of the um, supplies that I need. I will first answer the question, why is it that I like painting on just loose canvas like this and not sometimes on stretcher bars? Well, I do both. Um, these canvas flats, though, uh, I can lay them on the table here and I can paint flat on the table with them with the um, canvas that's already on the pre-stretch uh, stretcher bars usually I've got to work on the easel and I actually have gotten where I just prefer working on flat surface better. Also at the uh, at the back end when you've got your painting done and it's dry and um, you know the storage is always concern. How many spots do you have in your house or your studio or whatever to put paintings if you, if you don't sell your work or maybe you gift a little bit of it, you're still, uh, if you're a frequent painter and um, you know, you're going to end up with extra paintings that you just don't have a place to go but the closet with. And um, this enables me to take finished paintings. I can slide them in a portfolio and uh, just slip them right underneath the uh, couch or, um, you know, whatever. Uh, they store easily someplace out of the way is the moral of the story. Um, first off, we'll run through our supplies and I'll just, um, I'll tell you right now, uh, a lot of this stuff, brand name stuff, um, I'm not pushing this product for anybody. I don't have any sponsorships. I will mention brand names kind of incidentally just so that you'll know what I buy and you might choose that or you might choose something entirely different. Ordinarily, if I want to paint on a pre-made canvas, um, this is the brand that I'm going to be using. This is the um, Frederick's um, Red Label, and it's a uh, cotton canvas, and it's already been pre-primed. And they're economical. They're in, inside my comfort zone. And when I want to, you know, have store-bought, ready-to-go rig, then that's that's typically what I pick. Um, if I mess up this canvas, I usually um, will go to the back of it, I'll pull the staples, and what I do is I save the stretcher bars already pre-made, and then if I decide I want to take one of my canvas flats, I can uh, stretch that canvas over the pre-made stretcher bars. So these things, even when I, you know, goof up a canvas really bad and have to start over, the stretcher bars have a second act because I can always um, put this uh, plain canvas on. The stuff that we need is canvas, and before I even start rolling through that, we've got this, these new stacks of canvas here, and I have for several years now been working out of a stock of canvas um, you know, the wife orders stuff for crafts. We've made, um, you know, tote bags and other things. Uh, just, a, you know, a, a bunch of different projects. And over the years, you get these scraps. And for a while, they accumulated. And so I had this big, wide uh, variety of basically scrap material to, to pick from. And some of it was really kind of on the thin side. Some of it was, you know, nice quality canvas. And what you're doing is you don't know what you're going to get from canvas to canvas when you're just working with scraps. And um, I have finally kind of worked my way through all of that. And we don't have any of that material anymore because I've gradually along and along used it up. And about, I guess about a year ago, um, we did a test order. This is a place down the road from us. And um, I'll just hold it there and hope that the camera focuses. Seattle Fabrics 
this is where I got all three of these uh, particular pieces of canvas from. And it's all brand new stock. So what a treat to work with something that's new instead of an odd shaped scrap or uh, something that's all wrinkled up that has to be ironed. And um, the other uh, essential material, of course, is um, acrylic gesso. And this is the brand I use. I get that from Dick Blick. And uh, I think this is a one pound jar. Yeah, one pound jar, 16 ounces, and um, I find that I like this as a, as a gesso, and usually I'll put one thick coat on instead of, you know, two or three light coats. I'll usually just put one really thick coat on and go with that. Um, the reason that I use canvas like this, and I like this rough canvas, is the type of folk art uh, paintings that I do. Uh, I'm not a portrait painter, and I'm not a... Um, I'm not a um, finicky person about the uh, canvas that I'm using. I, I don't require expensive canvases and uh, Belgian linen and all this kind of stuff. So I like keeping in my own swim lane there and I like these kind of rough textures when I'm working with the uh, brush. I like to have kind of that tooth on the canvas that you can sort of feel with the brush and um, you get that when you order this kind of rough material. So. Um, the other thing we need is a good quality pair of uh, sewing scissors, some pencils, um, and uh, I have here also a uh, carpenter square and we can lay out our um, squares and rectangles with this on the canvas or if you have some of these stretcher bars around and they're already in sizes that you want to use, you can just take them put them down on the um, canvas and trace it. And we'll probably do some of them both ways just to see how it works. Uh, and uh, you need kind of a throwaway brush. And uh, this one ended up in my, um, I keep some brushes up here in a container that are for my craft and hobby, not for my painting. And this is actually a pretty nice brush, but it was too soft for me to use. And um, I kind of ordered it in a, in a multi-batch, but um, that's why this looks like kind of a, a nice new brush. It is, and um, I'm going to use it today or try to use it. It may not quite be stiff enough for putting this gesso on, but we're going to try to use it up today. Moral of the story is I went to look in my um, supplies bin for some of the hog bristle uh, throwaway brushes and uh, these are the kind that you buy at the hardware store for two or three dollars a piece that um, people use for a little odd job painting and trim painting and um, then they just toss them and uh, I, I was slap out of them which surprised me uh, so uh, I'm kind of using a slightly nicer brush today but um, Anyhow, I need to um, get some of this material uh, organized and um, reset a couple of the cameras, so uh, we'll be right back. And we're back again. I've made some adjustments to the camera, so I've got everything set up the way we need to be. Um, before I get started with this particular piece of canvas, I was going to say this is, uh, I mentioned the company earlier, uh, Seattle Fabrics. and. Um, this is an order that I put in and I didn't really know, you know, you know, you, you never know what you're getting when you put in the first order with the company and um, I was really satisfied with this canvas when it came in. The number 10 here, which is what I'm working on, um, it feels fairly stiff and I like the weave pattern on it. It's a good tight weave. It feels like a high quality product. The number 10 is listed as being 14. 0.75 ounces, which is fairly heavy weight. I have some here that is what they listed as their number eight uh, at 20 ounces, and I'm going to set that aside for today. I don't plan to use it, but um, that's a really nice piece of canvas there. I have to say, uh, I'll get to that at some point, and um, it'll be a nice item to use. This is um, something they described as a cotton duck. Um, it's a 10.10 .10 ounce sun forger and this is, a, it feels like a finer weave and um, it kind of um, just reminds me of a high quality art canvas. I, I think they sell it for different purposes for, um, you know, um, using seat cushion um, type fabric, that sort of thing. But uh, I believe that this um, sun forger, the 10 ounce, would go really nicely um, 
you know, if you're, especially if you're planning to do it on stretcher bars, but I haven't worked with that one yet, so I just don't know. Um, you never know really, truly, until you actually use it for the purpose that you're thinking. And um, I was going to, before I put these sa the sample swatches up, this, um, this last one on here, and I don't know how well you can see it, I'll hold it up. Um, this is their um, number one, and it's listed as being 29.46 ounces. And that canvas there would just about st stand up on its own. You could just about... Uh, clip that to the back of a frame and I don't even know if you'd need stretcher bars for it. That is a heavy duty material there. Um, so I picked a um, I picked a, a stretcher bar that I like the sizing on and what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to mark a couple here. I'm going to I'm going to mark uh, first off I've, I've left myself a good margin all around here probably about maybe four or five inches, and I'm going to mark the interior of this. So we'll have one that's a little bit smaller than the stretcher bars. And then I'm going to move over to this side of the canvas, and um, I'm going to mark one that's um, maybe... I'll turn it this way. I don't want to jam these guys up because I like to have space between them to make those cuts because you never know if you're if you might uh, you know want to put these over a stretcher bar you um, you need a little extra uh, for pulling that canvas around it and getting it stapled so anyway um, there's one down let's get this guy cut out and what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to use this carpenter square to give me kind of a, a good line to go by because I am not the most competent fabric cutter around. I've done a little bit of fabric and sewing work over the years when I have to, but um, you can see there I can't even apparently draw a good line. <laughs> we'll get um, that part marked. And I'm going to just go on while I have the square here in place. I'm going to give myself a few inches above that one that we just made, and I'll cut, get it cut out also. Okay, so pretty quick here, we'll have two pieces to work with. There's one, and here's our next one. I'm going to just with the with the square make up a canvas size uh, for my own purposes here, and I'm working with this line. Well, let's just go on and draw the line up there. I'm going to work with the line created by that cut that kind of odd cut that we made and I'm going to make that the um, dimension there and we've come in, I'm leaving my margin that I'd like to leave all around and I'm going to just draw our square about like that and I'll turn this carpenter square over and um, maybe pull it to about there close that corner up. So that gives us another one. It's kind of a little longer, a little skinnier. And we'll get that piece cut off now. This piece here, we could do a couple of things with. We've got a piece that's kind of um, longer and skinny, and I almost never do a canvas that's um, 
you know, that, that proportion, but it almost feels like a challenge just that the piece was left over like that. Um, the alternative is to try to bring it in and um, just cut a little small piece out, uh, maybe something over here on this end or whatever. But, um, you know, I think I'm going to, fate has kind of, fate and not thinking too far ahead has kind of dealt us this kind of longish piece here. And I think I'm going to, I'm going to just mark this guy as it is and I'm going to see if a, some kind of a painting comes to me that would use this canvas. So let's get this corner drawn in. And we'll go back and um, work the other side here. Stop it about there. a little out of square there, but you know, I don't see that that's a big difficulty. We'll make it work. And I'm going to just start with the smallest canvas first. And work them in size going upward, and I don't have a reason for doing it that way. It just seems like it makes the most sense. This one I'm looking at that one, and um, I mean, it's not a problem, but um, we've cut. It almost feels like we've cut a little short over here, and you know, before I go, we can fix that right now, and sometimes you're going to run into that. I think I'll just fix that rather than um, painting myself in the corner. I'm not sure how that happened, but I think I'd like to move this one a little a little further over and I'm going to do that. Some of you sharp-eyed folks probably spotted that while I was uh, filming it and um, you didn't have a way to tell me of course. Okay, I think this is going to work a little better. So I basically just moved uh, off this edge here, which made me a little nervous. So I have my usual margin that I like, and I decided to make more use of this piece there that I is a little softer than what I'd usually want for this, but it's laying down the gesso just fine. And I put usually a good good thick coat of this on and I don't plan to have to mess with it a second time and you don't really even have to keep precisely exactly to the lines you can run this stuff wherever you want it to go and I usually just get up right next to the line or a little over it and um, that's where I leave it This would not be taking quite so long if I had a slightly stiffer brush that I wanted to devote to this. The problem is that um, once you've used this for the gesso, pretty much it's finished. It will, uh, if any of you know a way to clean these after these brushes after you've used them with the gesso, you can let me know in the commentary below and. Um, I don't know of a way to clean off these brushes, uh, not where the amount of um, labor that you'd put into cleaning them up isn't asymmetrical to what you get back from being able to use it again. Okay, so we've got one there that is, um, I think, about right. 
I'm going to take the tip of the brush here and just work that gesso around just a little bit more. I've got uh, some either a little piece of canvas or piece of the brush that's fallen off or something. I'm going to get that off of there and keep going. And this is where I'm kind of just now going to take the tip of the brush and go back and forth. That looks about right. So I'm going to take this piece and put it off to the side to start drawing. And that is a little something which I'm going to try to get off of there. I don't know what that is. A little, that may be an imperfection in the canvas, which is fine. Some of the canvases I've used in the past, uh, I've gotten used to that kind of stuff. With folk art, I'm not sure it matters. This is not fine portraiture or uh, realism painting. And if it's got some little blemishes here and there, I really don't mind them. In fact, I kind of uh, have gotten, in the past, kind of gotten used to having them. And these nice new pieces of canvas that have no wrinkles and not many imperfections, um, they look kind of, they look kind of stark to me. It's like um, I'm working out of my um, punch, trying to box out of my weight class here with <laughs> materials that are too nice. I, I hope it doesn't stymie me when I go to actually paint these things that I'm thinking, what a nice piece of canvas. All right, uh, so we've got, I just made a little trim there. You were watching me do it. Uh, one side of this thing had gotten a little lopsided and I just, by sight, not using the the straight edge, I just took a little bit off. But, um, that got us where we needed to go. And I'm hearing some rumbling in the background. Um, we've got a little teensy commercial airport here, a few miles from the house. And usually on weekends, this is not a weekend, I'm shooting this on a weekday during business hours, but uh, you get a little bit of air traffic. But um, here lately, it's the jet noises from, we've got a base that's a military base about a half hour drive from here, and we have lately, they've been pouring it on. And it's those kind of jet noises that, um, not the kind that's sort of a pleasant roar off in the way distance. It's the kind that um, if you don't just stop talking and give up on the audio, uh, you're going to get trampled with your audio on these videos because um, I've tried to do it a couple of times and got in the house and it's like, yes, you can sort of hear what I'm saying, but so I don't try to talk above those anymore. I just um, edit that stuff out. Um, I'm hearing them rumbling in the back and I've mentioned to regular viewers of the channel here also we have um, reached the rainy season here. Uh, this is November as I'm filming this and usually the rains have, are starting in November. This year here in the sunny Pacific Northwest um, our rains really seemed to start in October and we had a couple of rainy days and then it was followed by another couple of rainy days and then we'd get four or five days of sunlight uh, off and on and then um, then the rains would come and the rains it, it was the November pattern in October so we kind of missed our our um, we get kind of a pleasant sunny dry days in October usually here and um, I hope the farmers around the area were able to get in whatever they needed to do because um, I think everybody depends on having that October kind of non-rainy sort of sunny warm days and um, it ran out on us really fast in October this year so I was getting around to saying um, out here in the corner studio. I've got a metal roof on this um, building. It is, after all, just a two-car garage, which I've converted the corner here for the studio. And um, when the rain starts, um, if it's 
very much of a rain, the light, the light um, patter of rain, not so much, but uh, when the rain starts coming down, I can't do audio out here either, so it, I would end up with an ASMR type of thing. Um, all right, let's take, um, we've talked enough about the weather. When you're talking about the weather in a video, you're, you've obviously got nothing to say. Um, I'm going to take some of the excess off of this piece here, and I really, you know, I'm, I'm down to, I'm just doing one more canvas, but um, I really should not have used this softer brush. I kind of knew, and when you kind of know in advance, I, I've got a, I ran out of those little cheap hardware store one-time use brushes, and um, that's what I really needed, but I had a slightly nicer brush in my um, overflow that's for um, stains and um, uh, you know it's it's a regular paintbrush but it's for stains and whatnot and um, it it's stiffer and I should have just used it I should have just said okay I'll do a couple of extra canvases and write off this brush uh, just as the cost of getting them done but um, I said no I'm going to use this softer brush and get it used up and get uh, sometimes when you are penny wise and pound foolish, you realize later. Um, but this brush is doing okay. It's just taking me longer to prep these guys than it usually would, and I'm ending up with this kind of excess uh, excess gesso carried to the edges. So I'm trying to make sure that I'm not encountering any unwanted ridges when I go to paint these things because um, that's the reason that you keep this moving this stuff around is you don't want you don't want unwanted ridges in there and uh, I like getting the excess gesso off as I mentioned earlier so that um, I can kind of have a connection to that fabric weave that's underneath this one looks okay actually as soon as I said that I'm gonna run the brush strokes this way. And I give it one more go. Alright, and I'll find a surface over here. Alright, last one we're planning to do. These things will usually, if it's not too chilly, they'll dry. And I can see right now, um, I turned the heat off out here. Temperature here in the studio is um, dropped under 60, and the gesso here, if it's maybe 65 or above, it'll dry pretty fast, like maybe 20 to 30 minutes. Um, when the temperature falls, it might take, you know, in 55 degrees out here, 50, it might take two or three hours for this to dry. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, in the video, I have to turn the heat off while I'm doing this, and um, or the heat will trample the audio. I've had some videos that lately that uh, I, I mean the viewers viewers may not really notice, but I dislike in videos a lot of edits. I like to just run uh, a video and keep it running as long as I can. Even if I've made a couple of verbal stumbles, I'd rather have that than a bunch of um, abrupt stops and starts where you've edited a scene and uh, the next one doesn't really match up with the flow or just the look at the frame. And um, I, so I'd rather have longer runs that um, maybe aren't quite as polished, but um, here lately, I've been having with the uh, editing just due to all the outside noise to... Alright, we've got that edge looking pretty good and let's start working on this edge here at the bottom. That doesn't look too bad. Need a little more on the brush. And 
work this side here. So we're just about at the uh, end of it here and what I'm going to do is just go ahead and uh, want to say thanks for bearing with me today with the uh, stumbles. We may have a lot of edits today and I may have to get rid of some um, some exterior to the studio noise. So um, thanks again for joining us and uh, we hope to see you in another video really soon. So till then, take care.